Hello, thank you for joining us on Caring and Comfort Studios tonight. I am Rosie Walker. I will be your groundskeeper, guiding you through Bluebeard's mansion and grounds with our lovely bride, introducing her to our home as she learns about us and herself. I would at this time like to read the folktale of Bluebeard's bride for all of our lovely viewers. So we're going to be playing an RPG tonight in which all of the lovely women in front of me are playing different aspects, different parts of one woman, the bride. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go over the basic folk tale upon which this game is based, and then our sisters will introduce themselves. They will go through the list of questions that we use during character creation. And from there, I'll go over some of the basic sort of mechanics of the game. Uh, one for myself, because this is my first time running it on stream, yay! But also so that you, our viewers, understand what's happening, because this is a fairly unique game. And I want everyone to appreciate what horrible things I'm doing to the bride and what awful decisions I am making her make. Yes. Cool. Sorry, I'm distracted because I hear my cat eating in the background. Um, but back on task. The folk tale of Bluebeard's Bride. Once upon a time, there was a very lovely girl, and she came from a poor family. They lived on the outskirts of town, and one day, an older gentleman came into town, a nobleman looking for a wife, older and with a beard that was an unnatural and enrapturing shade of blue. There were rumors that he had had wives before, but no one knew what happened to them. These were only rumors. He saw the girl and saw how beautiful she was and asked her family for her hand in marriage. He told her that he would care for her family. And so she said, yes. She married the man with the blue beard and she went to his large house with him. Once they were there, he gave her all the keys to the house and told her to go explore. Look through every drawer, open every door. It's your house, but do not go into my private chamber. And then left on a business trip, said he was gonna be gone for like six weeks. So the girl went and looked at all the jewels and fine fabrics and all the beautiful things she had never had at home. And she kept looking at the door and finally, her curiosity got the better of her. So she put the smallest key in the forbidden door and opened it. And inside were bodies of all of his former brides. Now, at this point, there are a few different written endings to this fairy tale. The most common is that Bluebeard shows up and says, I told you not to go in there. You should have listened to me. And then he raises his sword to behead the bride. Most of the time in these stories, the brother shows up and saves her. My personal favorite, her mother shows up and rescues her daughter. But in the original version, Bluebird beheads her. She needs to learn her lesson after all. The difference between the fairy tale and the game we are going to play tonight is that, again, these lovely people are all playing the same bride all in the same physical body. You represent different aspects of her mind in this game called Sisters. And you'll be exploring the house in search of tokens that will indicate to you whether Bluebeard really loves you and is just misunderstood or is in fact a serial killer and you are in grave danger. Audience, at this point, I am going to ask the bride to introduce herself a bit. 
I would like us to start with the animus. Animus, please go through your character creation questions and sisterly bonds. And from there, we will move to the fatale, the mother, and the witch. Great. Um, I'll be playing the animus, uh, which you hold onto righteousness with both hands. Others admire your strength and bow to your will. So we're starting with the wedding prep? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, just making sure. Okay, so uh, what are the bride's hands like? Uh, the bride's hands are uh, substantial with long fingers, uh, short nails, prone to hang nails, and many lines on the palm, something that was passed down from other generations, a genetic trait. What weakness do you give away when others hold your hand? There's a moment's hesitation upon receiving the touch, a half-hearted grip at times. When you first met, what loving gesture did Bluebeer make that won you over? It was winter when he started courting us and he chopped a significant amount of wood for our family, for our personal use. That showed me his strength and his willingness to care for me. What am I leaving behind from my provincial life to become Bluebeard's bride? I'm leaving behind solitude, not necessarily something I seek out, but something that occurs naturally within the structure of my family. What gift did you present to Bluebeard before the wedding? Why did you choose this? I presented him with a small amount of hand embroidered napkins with elaborate bluebells in the corners. I chose this to show my patience and my attention to detail and it being a treasured item as something I've been working on my entire life up until this point, not even knowing that they would be his someday. And do you trust your generous husband, Bluebeard, or do you hold unkind suspicions? Why is that? The animus trusts Bluebeard. He's shown his willingness to care for me and for us in his own way and given us more than we could ever imagine from this farm to promise novel experiences, which is important to the animus. For my sisterly bonds, you hold yourself apart from your sisters, but mother is the only one who soothes me and explain a time they calmed my rage. There were a time when my older brothers as a young child were teasing us relentlessly, not in an, in an abusive or violent way, but as siblings do. And at that moment, I felt very isolated and wanted to strike out, but the mother's presence called me and stayed my hand. I'm envious of the fatale. Explain why I never can compare to them. The fatale lives in the moment. The fatale embraces the here and now, her body, her power that the animus forgets in the quest to work toward the future, to labor, to plan ahead. And the animus will never hold that power that the fatale has. I believe that's it for me. Fatale, please read your wedding prep and your sisterly bonds. The fatale, so you drip sensuality from your lips. Others watch your every move and crave for you to take control. So the wedding prep, um, what does the bride's mouth look like? It's full and plump. Um, how do others keep her quiet um, through threats? What am I leaving behind to become Bluebeard's bride? I'm leaving behind the tree that I used to play under with my mother. 
Um, when we first met, what loving gesture did Bluebeard make that won me over? Well, in the midst of a debate between me and my brother, he saw my brother attempt to become physical with me and he overpowered him and threatened him. And he held my chin in his hand and told me that you are mine. No other's hand will ever be on you but mine. What gift did I present Bluebeard before the wedding? It's a silver comb. It's a small silver comb. And I chose this because it belonged to my mother. And because of his blue beard, I figured that would be my way to tend to him. Do I trust him? Yes. Why? Because he saved me. He taught me to be confident and powerful. And your sisters are who they are. Boring and predictable, but animus has no idea of a woman's true power. And I wish to teach her because once we join forces, the power of our sexuality is unstoppable. And I try to draw in the witch with my seductive aura, but I hide my insecurities from her through my sexual nature. I allow myself to become free and just truly be me. Mother, please read your wedding prep and sisterly bonds. Okay. Um, I'm playing the mother. You walk with authority. Others ache for your approval and long for you to soothe their wounds. Um, for my wedding prep, my first question was, what is the bride's figure like? And I think she is small and petite and alive. Uh, what do others wish was different about it? I think others, I think she still looks young for her age and others wish she would grow, look more like a woman, uh, have a more womanly figure. Um, what are you leaving behind from your provincial life to become Bluebeard's bride? Um, my dog that I grew up with, Gumdrop. Uh, Bluebeard is allergic, so he can't come with us. When you first met, what loving gesture did Bluebeard make that won you over? It was a cold winter day when he showed up and chopped wood. And I made a stew for the whole family not realizing that he was staying for dinner. And when he ate the stew, he just smiled slightly and I could tell that he appreciated it. And that pulled me in. What gift did you present to Bluebeard before the wedding? Why did you choose this? Um, to commemorate the wood that he chopped us, I gave him a hickory handled ax with the blade smithed by the neighbor boy I had had a summer fling with the summer before I met Bluebeard. Um, do you trust your generous husband, Bluebeard, or do you hold unkind suspicions? Why is that? Um, of course I trust him. He gives me purpose and a reason and is finally putting me where I should be. Um, my sisterly bonds. You know best and try to guide your wayward sisters, but the witch irritates you with her obstinance. Explain a time they undermined your authority. Um, I think you're about to hear it, but uh, the witch has a flair for the dramatic and her wedding gift was just too much. And it, her, her need for drama is going to get us all into trouble. Um, you trust uh, the fatal to have your back. Explain a time they supported you in a time of need. The fatal brings us people to care for and caring for people gives us purpose. And the fatal brings them in. Which, please read through your wedding prep and your sisterly bonds. Hello. I will be playing the witch. 
You braid magic from shadow and blood. Others desire a taste of your sin and pray for your undoing. What is the bride's hair like? It is long and blonde. How do others like to wear it? How, how do others like you to wear it? They don't really like my carefree, silky, novel hair. Um, for, and so for hard labor, they like me to wear it up, um, braided or in a bun. What are you leaving behind from your provincial life to become Bluebeard's bride? Um, I am leaving a farm full of chickens and cows and goats, um, all these loving creatures that gave me solace when uh, the men in my family did not. Uh, when you first met, what loving gesture did Bluebeard make that won you over? And so it was uh, the morning after he came to chop the wood and came over to our house to have dinner that he presented a beautiful black stallion, so powerful, muscular horse for our family. Um, and it just showed how much wealth and how much care he had because our, fa our farm and our family is struggling. We're, we're not as wealthy or aristocrats at all. Um, and do I trust uh, my generous husband, Bluebeard, or do you hold unkind suspicions? Why is that? Uh, of course, I, I trust Bluebeard. He's whisking us away from our mundane life. He is finally giving me what I want, which is power over others. We will have servants and maids and stable boys to order around and take care of the animals that we had to take care of in the family. No more hard labor for us sisters. Uh, your sisters are not nearly as important as power, but the animus is a useful tool. Explain how they help your pursuit of blasphemous crafts. And so, as Mother says, I am dramatic. I don't like to be dramatic in your face. It's rather a passive aggressive drama. And ugh, we all know that Animus is drawn to violence. And so, when I don't get what I want, I simply just, act, I just simply poke the Animus to be a little bit more aggressive and use a little bit more might. Um, but opposed to that is, Fatel draws an evil to her. Explain what you've done to keep that bit evil at bay. Uh, the Fatel and her, and her sensuality just draws the leering of dangerous men and women. It's her seduction is going to get us in trouble, and I don't want that notice around us. And so, I simply, whenever someone takes notice to us, the sisters don't notice and don't really appreciate it. But I curse and hex them. Whether or not it really works is really up to me, but uh, that's what happens. Magnificent. Our sisters have created a truly fantastic bride. She has sought comfort in animals, solitude, memories, and acts that recall her mother, who passed away when she was fairly young. Our bride has been surrounded by men her entire life. They have been abusive and distant. She has only memories of her own mother. As to what a wife, a woman, should provide for her family. All of our players are playing one person. And as such, they will be keeping track of two things. The trauma that their character accumulates during the game, we'll touch on trauma in a moment, and the loyalty and disloyalty of the bride. We'll get to that later too. Right now, in fact, a track of loyalty, faithfulness, and a track of disloyalty. As you go through each room, you cannot leave until you choose a token or beg for escape. You can try to escape without such a token or a truth, but the cost will be high and I will do my best to make you pay it. A token of faithfulness will mean you're getting closer to proving your trust in your generous husband and you will heal one trauma. If you take a token of disloyalty, you're closer to proving your unkind suspicion 
and you will take a trauma because you are living in the home of a serial killer. So that's where we'll keep track of your loyal and disloyal tokens. And these will be items that you remove from each room as you go. So you will name an item, it will go with you. A person does not count as an item. Trauma. We will be keeping track of trauma. Trauma is mental and physical. The sister that provokes trauma can choose to take it alone or pass it to all of her sisters. There's no real mechanical benefit to either. It's all about you, sister. The sister in control of the body must pass control if she takes trauma. Taking a token of faithfulness will heal one trauma. But if the trauma track fills for any one of our sisters, they will shatter, at which point I will ask you to flip over your sheet and look at your shattered side. We'll explain that if we get there. No reason to get everyone excited. And we have a mechanic to indicate which of our sisters is in the driver's seat. So it might be a little confusing in that we're all playing the same person or they're all playing the same person. I'm just tormenting them. But the bride that has the ring is the bride that has the final say. I will encourage our sisters to communicate with each other throughout the game, uh, sort of symbolic of a thought process. However, the bride with the ring will decide what the bride actually does. This will become important in some very key situations. This game is mostly narrative and based on our joint storytelling. When a roll is required, you use 2d6, but there are only three moves that will require dice. When a sister wants to perform an action, she uses moves. There are four different kinds of moves in total that our sisters can make. There are maiden moves, ring moves, face moves, and exit moves. Anyone can make a maiden move at any time. Ring moves can only be made if you have the ring. Exit moves are used to leave a room, but can only be made by the one who has the ring. Face moves are specific to each sister. A sister may use her face move as much as she dares. Now, we went over lines and veils during character creation last night, where we went through and spent a lot of time talking together and figuring out our bride and how she works. And they gave me some really wonderful ammunition to use tonight. We went over our lines and veils and this game addresses a lot of adult themes. It will become uncomfortable. The players and I went ahead of different things ahead of time, and I do have everyone's lines and veils pulled up so I can reference them as we go. However, if we get close to anything, if anyone becomes uncomfortable, or even if you just need a break but want to return to the same room later, I encourage any of my players to just give me a thumbs down and we'll take a break or just pause, depending on how you feel. You will present me with a new key and we will move on. So our viewers, that's a warning to you too. This is a tense game and it's meant to be cathartic, really. It explores a lot of horrors about being a woman. It's generally referred to as feminine horror. It's an area that gaming and society in general generally ignores or silences, which is why I chose to play it with all women for my first time running it on stream, uh, for my own personal comfort, really. I encourage anyone who wants to play this game to play it. I've played it with men. It's been just as fantastic an experience. But if something comes up that makes you uncomfortable, I encourage you to do some self-care. Thank you for dropping in. 
and uh, I hope you have a good night. Join us again if you feel comfortable. All right. Finally, the main portion of gameplay occurs when after Bluebeard gives you that ring of keys, our sisters describe a key to me and they open a door. From there, they interact with objects and we see what happens and the lessons they learn. Before we begin, do any of my sisters have any questions? No? Delightful. All right. Now that we know our characters, our bride, let's get married. It is the bride's wedding day. My bride, my beautiful bride, thank you for your love and your gifts. Thank you for giving me your heart, your body, and your life. I will treasure them always to my bride. Your groom raises his glass, drains it, and his blue beard and mustache become wet from champagne as he smacks his lips and smiles at you wolfishly. It's your wedding day. That morning, you put on your finest dress, the one Bluebeard had bought for you, and you bind flowers in your hair, blue boughs and wildflowers from the field near the tree that you sat under with your mother. At the ceremony, he kissed you chastely. Now, at the reception, you sit alone at the high table, drinking your own champagne, while he talks to guests who you do not know, but they all seem to be talking about you. You're getting an awful lot of looks. The party is over. He hands you into an elegant carriage and the gas lamps outside are lit because night is drawing near. He sits across from you with his side against the door and just watches you. He looks, that's it. He does not touch you. And then the carriage stops. He delicately hands you out and you see your new home. It is, I, it is ginormous. It towers over you, three stories made of beautiful stone, and the gaslight shines off the copper roof. And in front of you are a few stairs leading up to elaborately carved double doors. As you look up them, you see to the side and beyond the hedge that surrounds the grounds. The grass inside is dry and brown, dead. And then you enter the house and Bluebeard closes the door behind you. It is very dark inside. You cannot see the end of this hall, but you think there might be stairs. There's a lovely hickory table in front of you. It shines in the darkness. In that light cast by the only lit lamp on it is a letter to Bluebeard. He takes it and reads it while the coachman brings in your luggage. And then he turns to you. My bride, I was so looking forward to our wedding night. However, business calls me away and I cannot stay. But here, have the keys to the house. Look through everything. Make yourself at home, play with the jewels, make boats of my papers and float them in the bath, set fire to the furniture, tease the servants, I do not care. This is your house. But. Do not go into the room in the Northeast Tower. This is my private chamber and where I can find some rest from the stresses of the world. It is my private place. Please do not go there. I will be back soon and we will have our wedding night. You'll remember it for the rest of your life. And then he touches your hand as he hands you the ring of keys and he leaves, closing the door behind him. You are alone on your wedding night in a very large house where you have never been, but this is your home now. You are a little drunk and your shoes are far too tight. You hear rain hitting the roof. Animus, your present pleased Bluebeard the most. 
you have the ring. What does our bride do? Um, I would like to start moving, find a room to enter, immediately enter into action. That's what I would like to do. Do any of our other sisters have comments or feelings? Of course, Animus, you want to go have some action. Yes, I agree. We should we should move. It's a little I'm not feeling so great. I would like to find our bedroom. I'm not just going to sit here and do nothing. And I'm sure there'll be lots of little trinkets for you to peer upon as we en enter each room. How you know so I'm right. You can, can we slide out of these shoes first? Yes, definitely. And I will <laughs> I will I will take off the shoes and set them uh in a organized place, not just kick them off, but put them aside. And we're and walk barefooted around this house. Oh my god. I'm sure there's slippers somewhere. <sighs> okay, fine. The floor Have should be clean. A bath. Have a drink. <laughs> Once we're done, then Mattel, don't you think we have already had enough drinks? You want to be clear-headed, don't you? In and this what's house. The fun in that. Oh, Ugh. This is how we get into dangerous situations all the time, Fatel. Exactly. Why would this house be dangerous? Exactly. This is the it's safest place. Mother's correct. It's time to start getting to know our surroundings. As you say that, which did you have more to say? Oh, I'm just berating them, saying that uh, it's all about first impressions. <laughs> that it is. And as you are holding that ring of keys, one in particular catches your attention. As you move into the house, which key do you want to try? The key that I would like to try is, uh, it looks like a regular pewter key at the bottom of it with like that circular uh, ring. But instead of that notched uh, normal key form, instead is a dark blue glass orb where the colors inside it seem to swirl. Can you distract, can you describe the teeth of this key to me? Are they normal? Uh, no, I would say if it's possible to just sort of have that mounted uh, orb there. Ooh. I love it. Give me a moment. Audience, I am now looking at some of the rooms I've already made and thinking about this description to determine what room this key opens. Yes, I think that will do. You approach a door. It is beautiful, solid, wood, magnificent. You have never seen anything of such craftsmanship in your life. And in the center of that door is a sort of hollow where that glass orb of your key will fit. You slide it in mechanism closes over the key like a hand closing around your wrist and the door swings open inside your prayers are answered it is a bedroom the room is gorgeous lustrous there are different soft fabrics 
all with twining shades of blue through them. Today, it might be called a sort of ombre pattern. Rich and beautiful, you see bluebells on one of the side tables, just like your the napkins you gave Bluebeard. As you step inside, you see a very large, comfortable looking bed with a beautiful canopy over top. You see a makeup station lined with the most, it's the best money you can buy. That's all I gotta say, it's the best you can get. There is a jewelry box as well. It is closed and appears to be just as elaborately carved as the door itself. And there is a large stained glass window that just barely lets in enough moonlight. But there is also one lit light for you, as though a servant prepared this place for you, knowing you would be tired and would find it. This is your home. You should be comfortable. What do you do? Patel, I know you're tempted to just languish in bed, but um, uh, I was wondering, are there any additional details about the stained glass window? Like, is there an image? Is there, or is it just the colors? Do you want to approach and look closer at it? I would. All right. I just want to double check your move sheet to make sure there isn't a specific thing that we should consider at this moment. Yeah, I, I would assume this is like a um, I think this is a mysterious this is, object. I would like to describe it to you a little bit before we do that. Okay. But I'm glad we're on the same page. As I said, this is my first time running this on stream. It's a learning experience. So I very much welcome anyone's input on that sort of thing. All right. So you approach a stained glass window. It looks like it is three main panes going from the top to the middle to the bottom. At the top is a beautiful, adorable baby. It has just sort of tufts of golden hair starting. It has eyes that remind you of your own, lips that might someday be as full and beautiful as yours. The next pain is a young woman with long, straight blonde hair, loose, flowing, flowers tucked into it, much in the manner that you yourself enjoy. She is free in the woods, and there is a beautiful black stallion by her side. The final panel at the bottom of the window is an old woman. There, she is sitting on the ground, and her feet, are they in a grave? There is a shovel by her hand. This is what you see. What do you do? Now, at this point, may I ask the two questions for investigate a mysterious object about the window? I would say so. Just let me open that the window closed. I wish I had more screens. I didn't think I'd ever want more than two screens, but I do. Okay. Continue. Okay, so I can ask two of these uh, questions for investigate a mysterious object. So I would like to ask, um, besides the old woman with the grave and the shovel, what about this item is odd or uncanny? How much it resembles you. And 
I, as the animus, look up and down the window. We haven't courted that long. How did this come to be? People, people with money have ways of expediting these things. That's what I suspect. Maybe we're just his type. There's nothing wrong with that. He wants to see this till the end. Well, the other question I would like to ask is, what memories does this item hold? Ooh. You stretch out your hand and touch the glass. Maybe some of that blue glass set into the window of the flowers. And the memories of olds, they are of a woman that looks rather like yourself. She might be a little taller. She might be a little older, but she looks much like you. And she is crying, desperately crying and asking, why does his eye wander? What can I do to hold his eye? And she is looking in a mirror at herself. That is what you see. What do you do? Okay. Um, I would like to... I'm going to take stock where I get to ask one of a series of questions. I would like to ask what horror here is hidden from the bride? The horror really is that beauty fades and you have to live with those consequences. But surely, Fatal, with your presence, you'll find a way to make us beautiful throughout the years, won't you? Darling, his eyes can't wander if he's blindfolded. And, uh, Prey, uh, what are you planning to do when you're blindfolded? Well, when he's blindfolded, <laughs> the sensations will be the beauty. <sighs> Come now, we all know that, yes, beauty fades, and that's why we have to have power over this house. That's the only way that we'll find comfort here, not in the arms of Bluebeard, but being able to to take control of this household her beauty's gonna fade i want to take a look at this makeup that he's left for us i'd like to investigate a mysterious object very good you turn from the window and move across to that makeup station as i said it's the best money you can buy in your provincial little village you have only really heard about some of these items so uh, to stain your lips you've used berries there are what we today would more consider lipsticks there are blushes the sorts of things that are probably not made with anything safe but would have been beauty products at the time and it's all gorgeous it's all stunning it's all set it's all set in a manner that makes sense to you. What do you do? What about this odd item is odd or uncanny? You look closer and you notice one of the gifts you, your sisters gave to Bluebeard was a silver comb that matched a mirror you had kept. There was a brush that accompanied that mirror and comb. 
You see something that looks very much like that brush among the accoutrement on this table. It's odd. My, that was my brother's. Why did Bluebeard keep this item? Hmm. He saved you from him one time before. This is just him getting something back that rightfully belongs to you. I agree with the Patel here. We shouldn't waste any more time thinking about him anyway. Um, pardon, sisters. Mother, when you asked why did Bluebeard keep this item, was that your second investigatory question? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bluebeard kept this item because it is for you. It is rightfully yours. Okay. Let's, let's take it, Mother. I, that would have to be the animus who can take we could take it as a token of his faithfulness and leave this room why don't you put the makeup on don't you want to look pretty right now it's all in front of us we should he's not pictures. even here it's a wasted effort we need to practice we've never used things like this it's true and ugh, bluebeard can get us makeup at any point i can't point. believe i'm agreeing with the witch oh mother <laughs> This Let's house is doing fun. strange things to us all. Patel, yeah. what do you think? Are there any of his dirty clothes anywhere? Do you want there to be? <laughs> Maybe. Sure. Maybe. Yes. What is it? It's a shirt. It is... The sort of shirt he would wear under a more formal coat. It was just sort of tossed in a hamper. A servant must not have emptied it yet. And he might have sweated in it. It, it still smells strongly of him. I hold it up to me and smell it. The smell comforts you, but it is also suffocating. It suffocates you because as you hold that shirt close, you feel it almost as though it ratchets around your neck. As though like that door that absorbed that orb and held it tight as it opened, you can almost feel that smell, that, that feeling of a hand around your neck tightening and tightening because you are his. And you will do what you must to please him and keep his attention. And by God, woman, you will do what I want. And you feel that tightening and that tightening again. <laughs> what do you do? She lets out a moan. <laughs> okay. Patel, this is not the time. You <sighs> feel one of the buttons from the sleeves digging into your throat uncomfortably, almost like a nail. Okay, now I throw the shirt. You try to throw the shirt. The shirt does not go on its own. Hmm. You could dirty yourself with violence or convince your sister to do so. Yeah, groundskeeper, I was gonna ask, do I still have the ring? Oh yes, unless you okay. pass it to one of your sisters, you still have the ring. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. Because at this point, you have only used your maiden moves. Right, actually, so Fatal, uh, at your discretion, I will think, of, I would like to, as the animus, dirty myself with violence to disable the shirt and its grip. So that says it is a roll plus carnality. Please make that roll. Is and that we 1d6? That is 2d6. 2D6. This is a powered by the apocalypse system. Uh, anything seven and up is a success. Seven to nine, you choose from a list of items below. It's two options. Six and below, I guess I'll tell you what happens. It doesn't necessarily mean that you fail. It just means that I narrate. Okay, and I have a plus one here, so. Yes. Okay, so I got two fives which is a 10 plus your one is 11. Yes. That is a palpable hit. 
You okay. are successful. Describe to us how you remove the shirt. Uh, so is it the arm of the shirt itself or it's kind of the whole thing that's sort of at our neck? It's the whole thing somehow. Okay. Okay. Um, so what I would like to do is um, just make my hand in a powerful claw with my long and substantial fingers to grasp every single bit of fabric that I can from the shirt and cast it onto the bed. You do so. You've worked on a farm well, all of your life. Your hands are strong from labor. It is not unusual to you to have to hold an animal and force it to do what you want. You do so with the shirt now and toss it on the bed. And it lays there because that's what shirts do. Patel, you ha had us almost that was so uncomfortable. Of course, Animus had to step in. Why are you like this? But it hurt good, didn't it? It hurt good for you. I don't want to be drawing blood in this place. What if we get it? I don't want to feel like that ever. It's a narrow line to walk, Fatal. But I pray we can move on. There are things to, still to be seen. So I uh, would actually like to propose a truth about the room as an uh, exit move. Please do. Uh, I will need you to propose a truth, a token that follows that truth and declare loyal or disloyal. And we will mark that as we do so. Okay, so the truth I will propose is that there was a woman before us in terms of someone who looked like us that Bluebeard had courted, had married. And then I would say that's probably a token of disloyalty if I'm making that determination. You are. Oh, okay. wait. Yes, because you still have the ring. You did not give it to the Fatal. I did not. No, I still have it. And what token are you taking to represent this? Oh, so I'm taking something physical. Yes, you will take a physical item from each room to represent your loyalty or disloyalty. This item will move with you throughout the other rooms. Okay. I would like to, from the makeup set, to, uh, find in there um, the deepest shade of red lipstick. Ooh, yes. A worthy token. Well done. So... You were looking for a bedroom to sleep in. Do you stay here or do you go? Uh, I was go I, I was under the impression that proposing a truth means you're exiting the room. You were correct. I okay, just wanted so to see if you felt like actually taking a nap before leaving the room. I was trying to be nice. Oh, but I appreciate that. I'm going to skip the nap. Animus is skipping the nap. <laughs> That's fair. That, <laughs> creepy sh that creepy shirt is still on the bed. Yeah, exactly. All right. You exit the room. Do you put on the lipstick or just pocket it? I'm just pocketing it for now. Are you All sure, right. Animus? We could look really lovely for Bluebeard when he comes back. If this is Tonight what his past love liked, maybe this will help us win him over. And I mean, Fatal, should I don it now? Tight. Sure. Or keep him waiting. <laughs> well, as you have this internal monologue, you exit the room and start to walk down a hallway and you find your hand on that ring of keys again. You want to explore your home some more. Animus, 
please pass the key to one of your sisters. And that sister, please describe the next key to me. I would like to pass, uh, so I pass the key ring and the, 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 okay, right, the key ring. I'm, it, it's connecting now. Uh, I would like to pass to the mother. I think I'm slightly disturbed by the weird occurrences that happened in that last room. It reminds me of the witch and, um, drama, drama. So I think rather than that elaborate orb, crystal orb key, I'm looking for the plainest key on the ring. It's brass. It is a simple circle, a simple tine out and two teeth, nothing fancy. I know where I want to send you next. Actually, changing my mind. Set one for later, after you've earned it. Here first. You need to impress me a bit. You need to learn a bit more. A simple key, you say. Yet, it is an elaborate and somewhat odd door for the inside of a house. It is set with beautiful glass panes. The metal around it is twisted with vines. A beautiful design that you run your hands over. It is comforting in that it reminds you a bit of the woods near your home. You put the key in to a simple lock and you open it and you enter. And there you walk in and there is a rotund sense of decay. The room is lit by moonlight. No lanterns here, no servants to prepare your coming. As you step forward, your feet crunch over something, maybe dead leaves. You look down and it looks to be a thick carpet of dead bees. You look forward, there is a fountain wildflowers, a bench by the fountain and gardening tools and you're not sure, it's not very bright. You need to look closer. You hear the door close behind you. What do you do? I think, um, I want to walk over to the fountain and sit on the bench and wait for my eyes to adjust. You sit on the bench. It is by the fountain. You look at the windows and the skylight in the roof of the room. Light comes down and your eyes begin to adjust. And you realize that by your feet, leaning against the fountain is an object, something almost the size of a person, but you can't tell without getting closer. 
I want to go in closer to that object. You turn on the bench and get up, moving closer. You kneel. And as you kneel, you do indeed see that they are dead bees. You lean in and look, and it appears to be a woman, a dried corpse of a woman in this moonlit garden. What do you do? I want to take stock of a tense situation. All right, ask me one. What horror here is hidden from the bride? The horror of what happens when a woman gets what she wants. I shiver with fear. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Beautiful. When you shiver from fear, name the thing you are most afraid of. And I, the groundskeeper, tell you how it's worse. Keep the ring and choose two, or pass the ring and choose one. Mother, how do you proceed? I am afraid that I will end up a desiccated husk like this woman and these bees. And I'm going to keep the ring. All right. First, I will tell you how it is worse. And then you will choose two questions from the list below. It is worse than you fear because you may not find the solace of this dried husk. You may have to continue to live through the consequences of finding what a woman wants. What you might want or what this poor woman found. Um, so I have to choose two. You have to choose two. It infects the bride with its perversion. Ooh. And it has the bride in its clutches right now. Ooh, 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 ooh. You hear a buzzing and you look up from the body of the corpse to the mouth. You see its hollowed eyes, its mouth empty of teeth and its dried lips part in a dusty smile. And it says in a death rattle, I am queen here. There is no place for you. My children, my many children will chase you from this place. And from its mouth, from its rotting, dried holes, spill forth living bees. This dried corpse has become a hive of stinging monstrous things. They sting you. You take, I don't know, two trauma. Do you okay. take it all or do you share it? I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. Good on you, mother. Mother, you don't have to. Mother, this is your fault. What are we doing with bees now? I'm going to cry out for help. Okay, let me double check that to make sure. When you break down and cry out for help, roll plus resilience. On a hit, a servant comes to aid you and address your concerns and calm your hysteria. On a seven to nine, they will help you. But first, they need proof of your loyalty. Please roll. Six. Ooh, sister. For our audience, that is a miss. No one comes for you. Maybe they've left for the night. 
Maybe as this room was not lit, they know better than to come in here. What do you do? I you escape. Are, you escape. <laughs> you have the ring. This <laughs> is your right. When a bride chooses to escape, they decide to leave a room without proposing a truth. So when you attempt to escape without proposing a truth, the groundskeeper, myself, will offer you a hard bargain or ugly choice. If you pay the price, you escape. What ugly choices or hard bargains can you make here? You could always take more trauma. Mother. Barefoot running across the yeah, ground. That sounds, that sounds like a good idea to me. Thank you. All right. <laughs> As you are being stung by a swarm of bees, the bees beneath your feet seem to come to life. And they sting you as you begin to run towards the door. You feel your skin break out painfully. You might be allergic. I would like you to take another two trauma. Well, I have one left, guys. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's gonna be fine. Mother, this is what happens when you do irresponsible things like this. It wasn't irresponsible. All Mother did was open a door. She couldn't have predicted the horror behind it. There are bees here. What do you think? Just get out as soon as you can. It hurts, but they're just another creature of God's earth, are they not? Like we grew up with? These have we nothing can get to do with God. We can get past this. And now we're bleeding on our feet. We better find some help before we get infected and die with our feet bloodied. Oh my gosh. You are indeed bleeding. You think you can do better, witch? I Here. sure can. And I hand her the ring. Mm. <laughs> oh, I heard. <laughs> so, much, so much drama. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you exit the room. You have accumulated some physical trauma and perhaps some emotional trauma. Essentially, a mummy spoke to you and then exploded with bees. And now you are walking on swollen feet, feet swollen from apparently supernaturally alive bees, and you are bleeding on that beautiful dress. I would like you to describe to me the next key. I can do better, Mother. It's up to me to get us out of this situation. Uh, the key that I see is a skeleton key, and it's made out of uh, human bone. It's just a very long finger. And the keys are grated um, and jagged, like as if someone had specifically used this finger and cut uh, uh, rows across the, the bone. Um, and it's very smooth, like as if it was uh, washed uh, by the sea. Um, and it smells very briny. Oh, sister, you have given me a gift, a deeply <laughs> appropriate gift. <laughs> you find the door that that key opens. It is a beautiful blue, almost the same shade as your beloved husband's, his beard, his unnaturally blue beard. And just as enrapturing, it 
almost looks like it might be made of sea glass, the sort of glass that gets tumbled by the ocean and washes up on the shores. Perhaps you collected some as a child. That's what this door is made of. It would cast light if there was light inside, but it looks dark right now. You put that key of bone into a matching bone keyhole that looks like clasped hands. It slides in to the door, detaching from the ring as it goes. You have lost that finger. You have lost that hold. And the door opens and you enter. And as you enter, this might be the oddest yet, even odder than a room with a garden and a mummified woman. Now you are standing in apparently an open field with a lake somewhat off in front of you and you hear the yelling of people as they stand around the edges of that lake. You can't make out from here what is happening, but you approach, you move forward. And as you move forward, you see this group of men, you see the lake and you see something that looks oddly like a seesaw by the edge of the lake. What do you do? Um, how, how many men are in this room, in that crowd? There's a good number, almost as though a village had emptied itself of men and they have all come here. How horrific. We just escaped men and now we're here with more men. <sighs> Fun. You know what, I'm actually, this is not where I want to be. I actually think I'm going to pass the ring to the Fatel because Fatel, you have a way with men, and I don't. It's I'm I'll, I'll come I'll clean up after you do whatever you need to do with these men. Just like you to pass responsibility. <laughs> I wonder you. what would please you. Animals, animus. Remember our dog, our horses, our chickens, our goats. I could they never care forget just them. like these men. Well, we had animals. These men are animals, not the same. Then let Fatal work her magic. So I make my way to one, one that's not particularly in the group, one kind of standing by themselves. He ignores you. What do you do? I fake a trip and kind of try to land on him so he could catch me. He does indeed catch you, but his eyes are locked on a woman being led through the crowd and to the contraption by the edge of the lake. As you watch, and now that you're closer, really, I can describe this to you a bit. It looks like a seesaw, but the edge that's closer to the crowd is broad, as though many men could place their hands upon it. They're full weight, really. At the end, closer to the edge of the lake, is a chair with bindings around where a person's hands and ankles would go if they sat in it. They are leading the woman towards this contraption. The man that you attempted to approach and who caught you, his eyes were fixed on the spectacle. I take my hand and try to guide his face so he looks towards me. He does. And I'd like to use a face move. Please do and read me the text. Your beauty and charm get you what you want. 
When you trap a servant or horror with your feminine wiles, they will tell you a secret about either the house or Bluebeard. He looks at you. His eyes meet yours. You don't have to vocalize your question. He simply says, Bluebeard could have stopped all of these things and he didn't. I pass the key back to the witch and tell her <laughs> that is how it's done. I I would like to say, Patel, that yes, of course, you seduce the man and that Bluebeard's not doing anything to save that woman. I suppose it's up to us now to make sure that that awful fate doesn't happen. I mean, what are they doing? And as you ask yourself that, you hear them begin to chant, witch, 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 you will prove your innocence. And they begin to strap her into the chair. And you, you know, you probably have heard of, if not seen this custom, the drowning of a woman to prove that she is not a witch. If she survives, she's a witch and gets burned. If she drowns, she is clearly innocent and given a Christian burial. Small comfort, I'm sure. They begin to strap her to the chair. Uh, well, I am the witch is shivering from fear. This is what happens to us if you keep doing what you're doing. No one will know. They're I'm not sure she know. said the same thing. All right. Name the thing that you are afraid of, and I will tell you how it is worse. Why is and it then that? keep the ring and choose two from the list below, or pass the ring and choose one. I mean, Mother knows that I obviously don't want us to be burned, and I don't want people to know of the secret rituals that I took in the woods with the animals and the blood and the, you know, the carcasses and the and the blood potions that we I would make at at night. Uh, I suppose that it uh, it does speak to me uh, to you. Uh, take one trauma, just me, sister. I will. Uh, so I don't want to be burned. I definitely don't want to be in that machine. So that's the, what I don't want to happen. And uh, I will keep the ring and I will say that the horror will speak to me and that it has the bride in its clutches right now. Mm -hmm. uh, may I make a maiden move? After we resolve this ring move. Got it. Okay. Want to keep everything nice and clean. And who knows, you might change your mind after this happens. The horror speaks to you. It's almost as though her head turns and everything else becomes silent and still as she says to you, my fellow bride, I wanted freedom. I wanted power and that scared him. And he did not stop them coming from me. I believe he may have told them of my craft. All I did was heal and love. And I am here now. I am here now. And you said it has the bride in its clutches right now. It sure does. Time snaps back into motion. And she points at you before they lower her arm. And she says, witch, that's your witch, not me. What do you do? Animus, do something. Uh, I actually, I, if this is possible, I'd like to care for someone and I'd like to care for the woman you that's don't being stripped. To. You don't have the ring. Oh yeah, never mind. Sorry. She does have the yeah. ring. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I, but I no, think that's so. a maiden move. I'm sorry. I I rules boy. I I, I want to make sure that I'm correct in what I understand has happened. Which did you 
pass the ring or did you keep the ring? I kept the ring. You kept the ring. But All I'm right. telling Animus to do something about it. <laughs> That's totally fair. And Animus has chosen to use a maiden move. Yes. Which is care for someone. Uh, I believe this is the first time this move has been used. So I will read the text. When you care for someone, you ease their suffering and bridle their torment. They may demand a demonstration of your sincerity. What do you do? Interesting. To demonstrate my sincerity. Yes. Um, am I able to approach the woman being... Or is it sort of like I'm sort of in the crowd in the throng and I'm just observing? You can approach, um, especially after she's called you out as a witch. Yeah. Uh, they part for you and look very concerned and unsure of what to do. Okay. So I will approach her and then I'll look back out at the crowd and I will basically address them and say, we birth your children, we tend your homes, we work in your fields. Not all of us are witches. It is your perception and not the reality. You must think carefully before sentencing the mothers of your children, your sisters, your cousins, your daughters to death. All right, that was a display of your sincerity I assume you are attempting to care for this woman? Right. I will give you an opportunity to do that before the crowd reacts. And I just want to kneel in front of her and this its device and take her bound hands and grip them and look into her eyes and say, It's already over. Go be at peace. Mm. Can I, I don't know, I can uh, jump on this move as well. I would say yes. Okay, so I'm gonna actually use, um, I'm gonna actually do something so I can use my face, the Viper. Um, and I will, I will look, I, like, as we are holding the hands, I will look at her and say, you are only here to serve us. You are nothing more. <laughs> yes, of course, yes, we've told you that uh, you may be not in the wrong here, but you're only here to serve us, and you're worth nothing, and you're going to expose us, and I can't have you doing that. Um, and so, uh, you're simply going, and so I'm going to, uh, uh, s uh scream out and say, Sh oh my gosh, she's the witch. Oh, look at, look at the bleeding that I have on my feet and my arms and my body. Oh my gosh. Look what oh, she my. did to my feet. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I just want to have you read the text of your face move because it will explain what's happening right now. Um, when you care for a servant, by poisoning them with your lies, they choke on your words and die. Yes. <laughs> and just so, the men stumble back in fear at what you have said, and they exclaim, how did the witch do that? She is bound. She is truly powerful what can we do and she begins to spasm and froth and truly honestly choke 
on the truth of your words. And so she dies. Perhaps a less horrific death than drowning. Certainly quicker. Mm -hmm. But you are still in this room. And you're still surrounded by a very confused, angry group of men. And sister, we know that is not the place to be. Um, I am going to uh, uh, can I caress a horror? Can I caress like the, as in like the men in this room? You can, can certainly I... try. Roll those dice. That is a seven. Okay. On a seven to nine, it will shift its attention, but only if you participate in some way. A man in the crowd says, we need to make sure she's dead. And he goes to the lever. You have to assist. And uh, I do. I say, I'm not a fan of witches either. And uh, I will take on, I'll take her, her uh, wrist that um, I applied some poison to and put it onto uh, the, the machine so that they can uh, dunk her into the waters to make sure that she doesn't resurrect. And they do. And you do this three times with them. <sighs> Sisters, we're safe. Aren't you happy? Aren't you jubilant? Do you I think... think... Should... Go ahead. I think we should take a token and leave this place and never look back and never speak of it again. <sighs> Power, sisters, is what we should be going for. This is our future. It's either us, or it's either them or ourselves, sisters. We have to look out for ourselves. We either end up a desiccated husk or we end up drowned. Mother, none of those things will happen. Look at us. We're not drowned. Do you think our husband will appreciate your killer instinct? Do you think that's a quality he finds attractive? Animus, don't, why are you coming to me like this when you've hurt other people? You know what it takes to save ourselves. That's rich well, coming maybe, from someone. Or... Oh. Can you say it again, Fatal? The power may be what he's looking for. This may be a test of our resilience. Look at that, Patel. We agree on this situation. Scary, isn't it? <sighs> Always. Mother is right. It's time to move forward. Uh, yeah, I'm going to propose a truth about this room. Please um, do. I, well, you know, men and their hubris, they, they, from the, from the beginning of time, men love to regulate women's bodies. Um, so they just fear what they don't know. Um, and in order to dehumanize and gain power, they regulate and kill women. So that's what they did here to try to... Uh, these are Bluebeard's friends and loyal uh, individuals of the village. And they just wanted to keep Bluebeard safe from the clutches of witches. Um, but that does mean that uh, it makes it suspicious. Why is Bluebeard uh, cavorting with these villagers is beyond me. So I'm going to take, um, I'm going to take like a, a, a scrap of this woman's uh, dress to remind us of who we who didn't drown. I, I'm sure that maybe there's uh, some kind of token of the woman uh, herself. All right. And I want to double check on the tract. Is this loyal or disloyal? Disloyalty. Okay. We've been going for a little while. Um, 
I want to check with my players to see if they want to break or if they want to keep the tension rolling. I can keep going a little longer, but I'm also open to a break. Yeah, I'm the same. I, I keep going, but a break is, is welcome as well. All right. Lisa, what do you think? Um, Lisa, Lisa or Alex, what do you think? Me trying to be sexy with this fake wine really makes me need to pee right now. <laughs> Let's, take All right. Let's take a break. Yeah, that we'll was a pretty a intense scene. Uh, I would like us to take a little break.
Hello, we are back. Tonight, we are playing for you Bluebeard's Bride. We have an animus, a mother, a witch, and a fatale. These are our, our sisters, which make up the bride. I want to warn our viewers, in case we've picked up any new ones during the break, this is an intense game that explores feminine horror. Um, if at any point you become uncomfortable and need to leave, your self-care is important. I remind our players that if anything makes them too uncomfortable uh, to make this fun, then I would like you to give me a thumbs down and we will leave the room and you will provide me with a new key. If you need a break, you can say that too. It's an intense game. But for the time being, our return this game to our lovely bride as she walks down a hallway bleeding and swollen from bee stings having just killed a woman 
and then assisted a group of men in making sure she was truly dead. What's on your mind? Well, as the witch, I did what was best for us sisters. I mean, it's clear that the ways of men are still to regulate and control bo women's bodies. And so you heard that woman, she accused us of being a witch. You saw that we would be drowned or burned. We couldn't have that happen to us. I did what was necessary to save us. You act like we're not all in this together, that our lived experiences are different, that somehow you know above all the rest of us. Truthfully, I didn't know you had it in you to do such a thing. Adamus, of, of course we all do. You, of all, pe of, all of us, uh, know that violence is the answer. And in that case, in that room right there, it was the answer as well. I have to I don't kill in cold blood. I have to agree with the witch. Her fate was sealed. We gave her mercy in the end. Thank you, mother. You're welcome, sister. My feet still hurt. <laughs> well, uh, you know, Fatal, maybe it, it having giving you the ring and the key, you can find us somewhere more comfortable than being drowned or burned. That and so nice. your fingers find that key ring. They trace over one in particular. Fatal, describe to me the key you select. You have the ring. It is shiny, dark gold. Um, the teeth kind of resemble spirals. And the end resembles spirals. How long is it? It is a particularly short key, probably as long as your middle finger. Do you believe this key is truly made of gold? Yes. Thank you. You hold that key and you walk on your swollen feet looking for a door that you think it might match. And you find a door that is of that same dark, rich gold. It is luxurious as your hair. And it appears to have sort of cogs almost that make up its main frame. As you insert your key into the lock, it clicks and there's a click, 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 click as it finishes moving without your hand, and it opens. Inside, as you enter, you see what appears to be a study or a workshop. You see dolls and springs and what looks like there might be some masks set upon a, a large long table, and you see paints set along one end of that table and the brushes in different size orders and what looks like a fairly comfortable chair. As you enter, you hear the door close behind you and you look at the floor and you can see places on the floor between 
and along the table where it looks like the chair might have been moved regularly as though someone spent a great deal of time here bent over their study. What do you do? I go and I have a seat in the chair. It is surprisingly comfortable. It is a good place to sit as you've walked for so long and been in such awful situations. Never did you think you would spend your wedding night like this. And as you sit, you look at the desk and you do indeed see different faces of dolls and different paints that might come of that might be used to create their features different stuffing that might be used to create them uh small needles and fabrics that you similarly to uh i don't know if a came of during character creation going through on stream but during the two hour session we had last night it came up that uh they would sometimes knit small sweaters for mice it's very sweet. I believe that was the witch's detail. <laughs> you see clothes of a similar size, really. Maybe a little bigger for some. And as you sit in that chair, your eyes are drawn towards the end of that sort of slide in the floor. And you see a almost life-size doll in the corner there. Does anything in particular catch your eye or do you know what you would like to do? I would like to take stock. And my question is, what traps have been laid for the bride? The trap of vanity and the ever undying pursuit of perfection. Hmm. So the little clothes that was knit, mm -hmm. I would like to investigate it. You do so. Ooh. Is this investigate a mysterious object or are you just looking at it? Um, investigate a mysterious object. Ask me too. What memories does this item hold? As you lift up the fabric and you feel it, it is as though you are inhabiting the chair with another woman. She is bent over the table working hard. She thinks of herself as an artist, a creative woman who is attempting to make items of beauty that surpass her own. And she sits in that chair working on elaborate clothing for the dolls that she makes. Okay. What about this item is odd or uncanny? The simple fact that although there are many such begun items of this size. The only doll you actually see in this room is the life-size item towards the end of that chair slide. I'm going to pocket that knit piece of clothing. I imagine it reminds you of something you might have seen your mother make. You found her needles and old yarn. You've used them. You have found comfort in them. Does this provide you with something of the same? Yes.
what does our bride do from here? Just leave now as a token of his loyalty. That's all you want to do, mother? Why must you poke your nose into everything? Because this is our house, mother. Yes, our house, which I believe that this room was mine. Intended for me. For us. Animus. It seems to me that there are many diversions for us here. Painting dolls, makeup to paint our faces, and then, frankly, the horrors that we've seen and the horrors that we will, that the house will dredge up. I, as I've been, I think we should just, we should move on. I, it's been so long now without our mother the feelings that it brings, these reminders that we find, I don't like it. It impedes the way to the future. We barely remember her anyway, sisters. You don't find it a bit endearing? Maybe I do. Maybe you all are making me soft. Oh, Animus, you soft? Never says the sister that killed. That was a hard decision to make, sister. You won every time. When we look at the surface, everything in this house is beautiful. And when we scratch deeper, it turns ugly. So let's just look at the surface. You're right. We just we have to maintain our composure no matter how difficult things get. This is our life now. But maybe it is slightly endearing. Maybe I should take it as a positive sign that he's thinking of us even now when he's away. I mean, there have been signs of others, but still, maybe they just didn't have what it takes or didn't know what to do to properly exhilarate our love. And there's things about the others that are like us. We are, we are what he wants. We should take that as a compliment it is. We have power here. What was that? We have power here. You said uh, you what we did. You did do much. As you have these thoughts to yourself, you hear a muffled echo through the room as though through memory. You barren bitch. You can't give me a child. You can't give me an heir. Play with your, your dolls then. Do what you think will make you happy because you can't give me what I want. And you, on the surface level that you currently inhabit, as I said, that was through more like the, the sort of muffled memory that this room holds. You almost hear a sort of shuffle movement of that larger doll in the corner as though it has shifted its weight. It's time to go. I pass the key to Animus. <laughs> okay. Uh, in that case, I would like to propose a truth about the room. And that truth is
Bluebeard is looking for an heir, presumably a male child, and it's up to us to provide that or suffer the consequences. I got it covered. <laughs> and right. now, which token is an interesting question here? I think faithfulness. I do. I do too. I I do too. So I think we'll take a token of faithfulness on that. Yeah. You are closer yeah. to proving that your trust in your husband is well placed. And it says heal one trauma. Now, who gets to heal it? We have some more experienced GMs and players here than myself. My understanding from just reading the text is that it would be the sister or is it the bride? Um, yes. I've always interpreted the bride. Then I will do the same. So I believe the only two sisters to have incurred trauma, and I need to get better at just giving you trauma, really. <laughs> you gave um, me funny. Uh, you hey. gave her hey. four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. So please um, heal one of hers. Yes, I beg yes. you. Mother, please heal a trauma. And which I believe you too had a trauma. Mm -hmm. Please heal. Yes. And uh, what is the physical item you take from this room with you? Um, so Fatal had already taken the little... The little knitted sweater thing. You want to yeah. hold on to that? Is that still cool that we can just sort of roll that into this? I would totally say yes. You can put that okay. in your pocket, uh, maybe perhaps a different pocket uh, from your tokens of disloyalty. The scrap of the dead woman's dress and the lipstick. So this goes in a separate pocket. This is your first token of loyalty. And so you get up and you leave the room. And as you leave the room out of the corner of your eye, you catch that life-size doll turning its head to follow you with its painted eyes. And you open the door and you leave without giving me my fun. So, what happens next, sisters? What do you do? Uh, may I describe another key to enter another room? My understanding is that you need to pass the... Oh, oh, right. No, wait, the Fatal had the key when she entered the room. Is it appropriate for the current key holder to describe a new room or does she have to pass the key? Uh, I mean, it's it's really up to I, you. Probably want a new person to describe the next key, so uh, the animus sh sh uh, should be able to do so. Thank you. And viewers, I'm asking because Alex is awesome at running this game. She ran it for me at Gehenna Gaming's Virtual Horror Con, and I am thrilled that she agreed to do this with us. And everyone else here is also awesome, uh, but. Uh, that's why I'm deferring to her and asking her questions, because she has a whole lot more experience with this than I do. Animus, <laughs> I would ask you to pass the key. Okay. So I will pass the key to uh, the mother once again, my soothing spirit. I think, I think she's feeling a little better with the token of faithfulness. And I think she looks at the key and there's one that strikes her as particularly beautiful. It's rose gold and it sort of looks almost like it's made of lace. It's very delicate and soft and like has all sorts of, like it looks like it should be fragile, but it's not in her hand. It's very long and delicate. You describe it as rose gold. <laughs> How rich is that 
particular rose gold color. I have seen it in a couple of different shades. I've seen it as paler or I've seen it as redder. I think it's more pale. Like it looks almost like soft and lacy. Sort of pinkish. Let me consult my list of brooms. Right. You have described to me a pale rose gold key. Alex, I apologize for using she instead of they. You have described to me, mother, a pale rose gold key. It is delicate as though made of fine lace. And even though it is made of metal, it looks soft and fragile, and it is long and delicate. You see a door that, of all things, looks the most like it belongs here. Out of any of the doors you've opened thus far, it is stately and matches the masculine yet refined decor. And this soft feminine key fits perfectly into the hard metal masculine lock that clicks around it as you turn your hand and the door opens. And inside, as you enter, you see a portrait gallery. Walls are lined with the images, the very lifelike images of men that do not quite resemble Bluebeard, but may have been his ancestors, or they might all be different portraits of him. You can't really tell but they all stare from the walls down and they all seem to be looking at a couch and easel in the center of the room. The couch looks inviting and is a deep, rich, lustrous red. It looks almost sensual in its curved shapes and the easel is bare. But again, as much as there was in the toy maker's study, there are paints beside it. On a small hickory table, the floor of the room is of a paler red that continues to draw your eye to the easel and the couch. What do you do? I think my feet are hurting and I go lounge on the couch and put my feet up. You move farther into the room and it is though the eyes of all the portraits follow you. You are very aware of the fact that though you looked beautiful and stunning, as you approach the altar, you are battered and bruised and have experienced some trauma. You turn and sit on the couch, or I perhaps should ask, do you sit on the couch or do you stretch out? I think I, I think I stretch out, but like I, I kind of do it a little awkwardly feeling the eyes watching me. Like they're just paintings. It's it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Keep keep your wits about you, mother. Why <sighs> oh, this room at all? As you sit, as you lounge, 
rather comfortably on this couch. You remember some rather pleasant afternoons with the blacksmith's son, spent laying with him after a bit of fun, him behind you, his arm wrapped around you. You feel a body on that couch behind you, holding you close, and a woman whispers, ah, so instead of painting me, you want to join me. That's fine. Uh, I want to take stock. Ask me one. What stops a bride from the shadows? The male gaze and how it devours and strips us away. Oh man. I think mm -hmm. I lean in to what I feel behind me and apply some of the lipstick that we took. Oh. Very good. There you go, mother. We want the same thing, Fatal, even if it's for different reasons. And what do you do? Um, I want to Do you need me to describe more? Yeah, or... if you could say more of what happens. I can totally do that. <laughs> so you apply this dark red lipstick to yourself. And she, this apparently woman behind you pulls you close and says, Oh, you're already beautiful, but I love that you're making yourself prettier for him. And as you look forward off the couch, you see the silhouette of a man standing behind the easel and raising paint to the canvas. You can't make him out, really. And as he begins to paint, your eyes are captured by the different portraits around the room as their mouths begin to open, becoming black pits. And the hold, the gentle hold of the woman behind you begins to become feeble. As the color of the portraits becomes richer and darker. Have I described enough? I think so. I think I let the painter paint for a bit. I, I lay there and let him paint, and then I get up and I walk behind to see the easel. It is beautiful. It is an exquisitely detailed work of you in all of your glory, lying on the couch beside a nude woman. Beautiful almost as beautiful as you, as she holds you close, her lips resting against your ear. But you almost get the sense, really, it becomes clear when you look at the couch. She is no longer there. And yet the portraits of the men around the room feel so much more alive for her loss. What do you do? I take a brush. I put it in my bag as a token and I'm gonna propose the truth. What is that truth? That if we have enough beauty, he will not simply waste us away this quickly. That we will sustain him for the rest of his life. I 
but don't forget Mother and Fatal to sustain the beauty, to sustain the image that he wants for us, even as time marches on. Sustaining the beauty takes work and effort, sweat, time on the floor, pressing ourselves up and down, strengthening our muscles, applying the generous cosmetics that he's provided to keep our skin soft and supple. It's not something that we will retain on our own, but are expected to use what's around us and to labor on our appearance. I agree with the animus this time. If the animus is suggesting that we do push-ups, I'm all for it. <laughs> We're already too small and wiry. Right. Mm, perhaps you're right. All qualities which we have displayed thus far. Right. Mother, you have described the truth and the token, but you have not told me if this is loyal or disloyal. This is a token of faithfulness. Loyal it is. I want to double check with our sisters. We now have, by my count, two tokens on each track. Is this correct? The next room will decide your fate, my bride. Unless we escape. Unless we escape. <laughs> we can keep playing forever. Oh, I don't think you want me to do that to you. <laughs> but... You have performed the necessary actions. You have proposed a truth. You have taken a token and declared yourself loyal. Heal one trauma. I'm down to two. Cool. Now then, please pass the ring. I'm going to pass the ring uh, back to the animus. Alrighty. Seems fitting for the final room, almost. <laughs> All right. Uh, shall I describe the key? Yes, please. This key is dark pewter, heavy metal. Despite the heaviness, as we feel it in our hand, there's an ethereal quality, like it's fading in and out of existence, so much so that we almost feel like we'll drop it at times. The head of the key has many intricate turns, angles, protrusions. And I would say it's about a an average size of a key. It doesn't it doesn't seem long or short, but just the appropriate size for a key. You have given me some lovely description. I am going to consult my notes to select an appropriate room. I think this one will do. You walk down the hallway with two items in two pockets. One pocket full of disloyal items, the other full of loyal tokens, those that remind you that Bluebeard has been generous. They feel very even. 
It disconcerts you. You move forward, holding that key, looking for a matching door. And it strikes you. You see a door that appears to be part of the wall, as though hidden. You might have passed it if you were not looking for it. But you were, sister. You take a step back and you touch the wall, feeling the edges of the door. It is not straight as a door normally is, but has slight curve to it, almost feminine. And there is a spot for your ethereal key. You slide it in to the lock and it does not so much sink into the door as simply become another curve within it. The door opens and you enter. As you enter, you are almost overwhelmed by the wash of red color that greets you. There is a rich red carpet. There is a even darker red chair in the center of the room. The walls are an almost faded red as though they were painted before the carpet was laid. And in each corner of the room is a mirror. So that if you look in the mirror at one corner, you might see behind you reflected in the other. There is a light in the room. You can see it shining off of the heads of pins and needles that have been sunk into the arms of the chair. Beside the chair is a small table with a basket and small blankets beside it. What do you do? The first thing that I think observing the mirrors sisters will we never escape observation the paintings watch us the spectacles throw our external sisters into danger observing her we observe ourselves to apply this makeup is there nowhere i can be alone What's wrong with being watched what are you suggesting, there, Animus? I don't have a suggestion. It's just... It unsettles me. There are things everyone must do in private. And upon saying that, um, I would like to investigate a mysterious object in the form of the mirror in the back left you said they're in the corners right there are mirrors in each corner okay so i want to i want to investigate the mirror in the back left of the room and um I'm going to ask, what memories does this item hold? As you look in that mirror, it is much simpler than the door. It is straight and hard and has 90 degree angles at its corners. You look into that mirror and you see as though it reflects the mirror at the opposite corner, a woman sitting in the chair, bent over small blankets. And she is embroidering bluebells into one of the corners and whispering, oh, my child, my beautiful baby. And then the image is gone. The animus thus far 
has been trying not to think of our mother so far in the past the pain and impediment to our future but this image in the mirror it feels too much so I'm going to shiver from fear very good this is a ring move the gra- uh, I'm just going to read the text more to remind myself than you. Uh, when you shiver from fear, name the thing you are most afraid of. The groundskeeper will tell you how it's worse. Keep the ring and choose two, or pass the ring and choose one. What do you do, sister? The thing that I'm most fra- afraid will happen is that I will never be truly alone again. And I am going to pass the ring to the witch. And I, in terms of the choose one, uh, I will take one trauma it speaks to you take one trauma just me very good sister i now have to tell you how it is worse than you fear you fear that you will never be truly alone again this is the last night of your life that you will be alone in a room from here on there will be servants at your beck and call And though you may think that gives you freedom and power, all it means is that there are eyes upon you, eyes that see, and mouths attached to those eyes that tell Bluebeard of all you do, even while he is away on business. This is, this is fine. This is fine, Animus. This is what we wanted. We wanted power here. And simply a serpent just has to appear and we'll, they'll just do what we say. And honestly, what is the difference from the eyes and the mouths here than home with the eyes and the mouths of our brothers? And as far as being afraid to be alone, we were alone there and we weren't happy. We wanted the companionship. We wanted to be our mother. We wanted the family. So what is it that you truly fear? The never ending gazes. Was I afraid to be alone? Our brothers are married, grown. It was just us, you're right. And was there a loneliness inherent in that? Yes. I can admit that. All of you feel it, sisters. But did we take it for granted? And now the servants, our husband, there is no escape. This is what we've chosen. And as you have that internal monologue concerning your privacy, you hear a moan from behind you and you turn and that woman you saw bent over in the chair stands by that chair as though leaning upon it. Her belly is large with child, but there is blood between her legs that spatters her simple white shift and she looks at you and she removes a pin from the arm of that chair and sinks it into her flesh and says we could not give him what he wanted and so we bleed and as you look at the carpet you see that it is not an even shade of red but there are speckles and darker shades where there might be washes of blood and you watch this woman impale herself, what do you do? 
sisters, this, this woman does not know her worth. She can't be bleeding across the floors like this. It's a waste of human blood. It could be used for something else, like a love potion or a different kind of potion. Um, I'm going to attempt to caress a horror. Um, yes, I'm going to go to the woman and tell her just to take hold of herself, to stay strong. Roll those dice. I lose fear of us now, Animus. Ooh, I got a 12. <laughs> That is a success. I give you the power of narration. Well, sisters, uh, the bride goes to the woman and clearly she's in pain and doubled over. And so um, we go over and we we uh, sit beside her on the, the arm of the chair and we I simply give her a, a hug and I, I try to comfort her and say, stay strong. You could not give what Bluebeard wanted, and that is your fate. But just accept it. You have more value than just giving birth um, to children. You are a woman who has power. Never forget that. Uh, can I do a maiden move? First, I want to resolve the caress of horror. So our witch succeeded, narrated the scene, and she almost relaxes into you as she accepts your words and finds some comfort in them. And then Fatal, you want to use a maiden move. I, as she relaxes into me, I hold her hand and caress her hair. Um, I want to use care for someone. And I tell her that it's okay. Rest. Be at peace. She looks up at you and says, how do I know you are sincere? This is me as a storyteller demanding a demonstration of your sincerity. Hmm. Mother? I think we pull the um, sweater we have, or no, the small piece of dress we have from the witch and use it to soak up the sweat on her brow. Uh, kind of ease the pain. Good job, mother. Keep her in her place. Know that we're the most powerful woman in this house. You're lucky she can't hear your internal monologue. She <laughs> is comforted by your gesture. She doesn't go away. And there is yet more blood between her legs. But she seems more accepting of her fate. And the fact that she will not be able to fulfill the role that has been given her by the time of her birth. What do you do? Um, I'm gonna pass the ring. You know, I've already told her that she better believe in herself or just like, you know, get lost and eat rocks. So uh, let's see, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it to um, I'm gonna pass it to the Fatel. So I lay her down and I go to get one of those blankets and attempt to cover her and soothe her while she can go on to whatever place she's gonna go to. This is kind of you, sister. Those blankets are small baby blankets. And yet, though it does not fully cover her bodily, 
she holds it tight and says, ah, yes, my sweet, sweet baby. And she holds that blanket and your hand and she stills. And yet the color of the rug still darkens and you feel as though it becomes a wet clotted sponge beneath your knees and feet as you kneel beside her. And you begin to feel yourself sink into that red. What do you do? Um, I'm going to try to attempt to stand. Okay, you will do so, but you will take one trauma. This has been a fairly awful experience. Do you share this trauma or do you take it all upon yourself? Myself. Give it a mother. <laughs> Very good. You stand. The parts of you that make contact with the rug are no longer your wedding white speckled with blood from the bees. They are a darkening red as you feel your feet begin and continue to sink into the thick carpet that becomes a bog of blood. What do you do? I'm going to cry out for help. Because that's going to help us right here. Because you just like that woman just died or something. Okay, well, can you think of anything better, witch? Well, let's see what the servants can do. I don't want to keep I keep during my hands here like you have. All right, roll those dice. 2d6. Add your resilience, please. Seven. You barely made it, but you made it. They will help you, but they first need proof of your loyalty to Bluebeard. You call out for help, and a woman enters the room. She is wiping her hands on her apron, and she is looking around and says, Oh, dearie me, my darling, you must be our master's new bride. I'm so sorry I missed you at the door. How can I help you? This is when I pass the key to mother. <laughs> like the ring, the ring. Sorry, ring. Pass the ring. I am, I would like, no. I think that because you declared this move, you need to prove your loyalty to Bluebeard before you can pass the key. Hmm. <laughs> and how do I go about doing that? It is a narrative action. Hmm. Get creative. Flatter him with words, Fatal. I have an idea that's so bad. You can suggest it. Oh, no, it's so bad. Oh, <laughs> now you have to tell us. You have to tell us. Come on. Feed me. This woman has had a stillbirth that is the dead child of Bluebeard, it should be given a proper burial. I love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's. Fata, what do you say to this serving woman? This is the young master of the house. And to bury his body amongst the most beautiful rose bushes that we have in the garden. And groundskeeper, just for clarification, so this house servant is seeing this entire, the scene in its entirety as you've described it to us, the bride. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. She says, oh, I believe you are right, my dear. And she comes to you and she soothes you and she takes that child, and holds it, wraps it in one of the unfinished blankets and coos to it a little. 
says, I will bury it as you have instructed. It is only right. But you have business here before you can leave. As a woman of the house, you must tend to your duties before you can leave this room. And she takes that child carefully, lovingly, and leaves you. Your feet are no longer soaking into the carpet. But I, as your groundskeeper, remind you that you have to do certain things before you can leave this room. Wow, that uh, that servant was unfazed. That's a little mm, striking. You still want to pass the ring, or are you holding on to it now? Oh, yes, I'm passing. Okay. That's a mm for me. I would like to propose a truth. Please do. I want to take this woman's sewing needles and put them in my pocket with the small sweater and the other tokens of loyalty, of faithfulness. Why are you so faithful, Mother? This woman couldn't give him what he wanted, but will be able to. You, you saw what happened. He punished her. He saw- because she could not do what was expected of her. We're better than that. Or maybe that's what she wanted us to see. <sighs> I remind our lovely bride that it is indeed the mother that has the ring and has the final say. Mother, am I correct in understanding that you declare your third token of loyalty to Bluebeard? I do. And so you exit the room. And now I get to consult my oh so freaking beautiful core book. Like this is amazing. (laughs) Because there are a variety of things that can occur at this point in time. I will offer you options. You will answer questions and we will determine how this game ends. Should have marked this page. It should just say the the final room and should be closest to the playbook. Yeah, it's 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 in the um. It's right after the witch. The character sheet. um, The character sheet. PDF too, if you have that up. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's on the second page of that. Yeah. I will consult that then. Yep. All right. So we have a faithful outcome. Don't forget the sentence. It's very part three. You traveled these dark halls in search of a truth most divisive. Each room provided you with all the evidence you desired to make that one fateful choice. Now you stand before the forbidden final room and you must decide. And sisters, I will describe this final key to you if that's all right. Your hands find a key that is large and made of blue steel that reminds you of your husband's beard. It is too big for your hands, but you muscle it into the lock and you pause to think for a moment. When the bride 
collects enough evidence to prove her husband's loving intentions. As a faithful bride, she must choose to either enter the room or look through the keyhole. Go around the table and ask the sisters if the bride chooses to enter the room or look through the keyhole. Animus, what do you think the bride does? I think that we look through the keyhole. Fatal. I think she's had enough. I think she's just going to look through the keyhole. Mother. I think we enter the room. Ooh, spicy. Witch. I agree with mother. We should also motherfucking enter the room. So it's a tie. Finally. <laughs> it's a tie. <laughs> Ooh. Alex, how would you suggest we resolve the situation? Do I roll a dice and ask for a high or low? Or what do you do? There's two ways. Um, it, it, it usually suggests that all sisters must be unanimous and that we just argue about it. Um, but uh, if we also have, if you just want to give one person the ring, like randomly roll a die and just like see which number lands and it's the person with the ring just collects all the thoughts and just makes the final decision, that's also what you can do. Um, usually I make it unanimous. Uh, I, I, I'd like to open the floor. For I believe that here. best. Discuss amongst yourself, sisters, and tell me what you decide. This may surprise you, mother, but after your declaration, because you have collected these tokens of loyalty, I compromised for you to simply look and not enter because didn't our husband forbid us to do so and a look through the keyhole a more minor infraction but if it is your will to enter the room i will concede to enter the room as well yes don't you want to see what's behind the room this is again our house there was nothing stopping us really from getting hurt in the process um i'd like to add um this heifer right here drowned somebody we really want to listen to her <laughs> he's the one who did what needed to be done and not I... only that but if we if he forbid us what if everything that we experienced we experienced it because all these women sat there and disobeyed him. Do we really want that fate? He's never gonna know. He's not gonna know. How would he know? He isn't here right now. How about just a jar? Just like open the room a, jar, a door jar. Mm -hmm. like Are we forgetting to... eyes and mouths all through this place? Wouldn't you like to really know? Really we know are somewhere? his wife. Should we not know him most intimately? Will that not bring us closer to him ultimately? Wait, Animus, are you on our side now? Yes, I'm on, <laughs> I'm on Enter side. So I'm now, on Enter side. I'm on Enter side now. We yes. are three to one. I would ultimately like you to convince the Fatal, but I will only give you two minutes to do so starting now. I've made my case. I understand your reticence as I shared it at the beginning. We're going to be closer to him than all those other women. We are the ones who enter his study. Patel, remember that you're an all powerful seductress. Yeah, Bluebeard will say, then go into the room and then you just say, oh, sorry, dear. And then please him at night. He'll, he'll forgive the whole, the whole, uh, uh, incident automatically. We have nothing to fear. Okay. All of us together At the same can time. face what's in this room and ultimately 
use it for our benefit, the benefit of our marriage, of our future. I will go around one more time and ask the same question. Does the bride choose to enter the room or look through the keyhole? Animus. Enter the room. Fatal. Enter the room. Mother. Enter the room. Witch. Enter the motherfucking room. <laughs> I would now ask all of you to consult the quick start rules under the final room, under enter the room, within the fateful outcome column, as I will be asking you these questions. I will be asking you these questions one by one and moving around as we did previously during character creation. I would once again encourage you to speak amongst yourselves, but I will address these questions to one particular sister as we move forward to best mirror the start of our game. Animus, what were the bride's last loving words to Bluebeard before he killed her? Her last loving words were, I came all this way for you. Fatal. What room does the bride's soul reside in? And at this point in time, I remind you of the women that you saw in the rooms attached to those keys. So I would like you to describe to me the room that you inhabit for future brides. The doll room. I would like you to describe your own room. Oh, my own room. Okay. So my room is going to be um, pure white. Um, big white bed, uh, gold, um, gold and white sheets, um, pillow. However, once you sit on the bed or touch the bed, you will get pulled. To where? Whatever your greatest fear is. You are the mirror for future brides in a place of comfort. Mother, what about the way Bluebeard displays the bride's dead body makes her happy? And I read this as referring back to the original folk tale when the bride opens that final door, she sees the bodies of the previous brides displayed. How is your body displayed in this final room? And how does it please you? I think she's hung up high so that others can see her. So that when you come in, she is easy to see. And I think at her feet is the ax that she gifted him. Hug? How? I think on like a hook from the back. We're at our most beautiful. Mm -hmm. The center of attention will never grow old. Mm -hmm. In the prime of our beauty as society dictates it forever. Which? How does the bride disguise the horror done to her body? You may address this to either how her body is displayed or the room in which her soul resides, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, well, uh, she is front and center and uh, she's covered from head to toe in white lead makeup. Um, so you cannot see any of the blood and she is simply looks like a porcelain doll. Magnificent. 
Then my sisters, to all of you, I address this final question. How does the bride punish future brides for their transgressions against Bluebeard? I remind you that you experienced certain things as you explored the house. Imagine what a future bride might experience as she enters your room. Well, I would let I would like it if, if uh, men, uh, the future bride, men would take the bride and uh, attach her to a cross and burn her with hickory in the hickory wood just burns, and uh, all she can hear is the howls of cows and chickens and goats. It's very disorienting. Sisters. Does this please you? It does. It does. Fatal? Yes. And so it is. And so it shall be marked in my personal book of rooms. Thank you for this gift. And so we conclude our stream of Bluebeard's Bride. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I did. This was a total thrill. I loved it. You're all fantastic. And once again, I am so happy that you all agreed to play with me. And this game was the result of Caring Comfort Studios hitting a funding limit on the Trevor project that they were trying to reach. And for some reason, people wanted to watch me run a game. So I said, okay, it's fine. I don't mind helping you raise money. It's a good cause. And, uh, you know, you can, you know, find me on Carrying Comfort Studios, Gehenna Gaming and Vorpal Tales, doing various things. And now I would love it if we went around and I would like my sisters to introduce themselves and say where our audience can find them I will go in reverse order that we have been using previously. So I will start with the witch. <laughs> Hello, everyone. When I'm not acting witchy and trying to uh, burn or drown other witches, um, I you can find me as Alex um, at uh, Daredevil Alex on Twitter. And, uh, you know, I'm usually on various uh, t- uh, uh, AP streams for charity so thank you so much Rosie for inviting me this was so fun it's so exciting to just get into the horror I usually run it but I don't get to be the bride too often so it, it really brings out the like the horrific in me so this was an amazing time thank you thank you uh were you in a game of necrobiotic earlier today I was I was playing two games and so I was I was like in a flirt I was a flirty like engineer and then I had to like like turn the course and be like whoa I'm a witch so it's a good time yeah you put your witch hat on I did (laughs) thank you awesome all right mother oh that's me uh sorry uh hi I'm Natalie Pudum I'm a professional game master with Charm Person Games out of Baltimore Maryland but doesn't matter if you're in Baltimore you can book with us online we run games we'll run literally anything for you you point us at a system we'll learn it we'll run it for your group your party your bat mitzvah your funeral you want to play this game but <laughs> don't know anyone who can run it I can run it just pay us um also, uh, I run a stream here on this channel every Thursday night at 8 p.m. called Comfort County High. It's a Monster Hearts 2 stream. It's the thing I've done that I'm like the most proud of that I've ever created. Uh, you should tune in and watch. Uh, all the up- past episodes are up on YouTube. Please tune in. That's it. Yeah, I can vouch. That's a really fun game to watch, and I totally recommend it. And you can catch it for free on Carrying Comfort's video on demand. So mm-hmm. go check it out. And I know that our lovely producer, Wes, brother Wes, who is the head producer of Carrying Comfort Studios, is very good about putting stuff on YouTube. So if you can't find it on Twitch, check it out on Carrying Comfort's YouTube. And now we are moving to the Fatal. Hey, everybody. You can call me Kitty Kimchi, and I am 
all over the place. So if you want me in any of your games or whatnot, you can find me on Twitter at, yep, she's Blasian. So <laughs> that's just me anytime. <laughs> cool. And I played Colt with Kitty and I had a fantastic time. So I was, uh, I was trying to decide who I wanted to play in this game. And I thought of all these lovely ladies and I thought, Kitty can take this. I'd like to play yeah. Kitty. I was the I was the college student, but you know I had I had fun in this role. To let me you know bring out my my inner hoe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, remember everybody, hoe things and no, that's that is not the right phrasing. I am sorry, nerd things and hoe dreams. There we go. <laughs> Love it. And uh, if you're interested in seeing more of Kitty and myself together. Uh, that game of cult was on uh, Gehenna Gaming. You can find that on YouTube. It was pretty fun. It was run by Marchosius. It was awesome. And now, last but not least, of Martlet Gaming, our fantastic Animus. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a creative partner uh, at Martlet Games, as Rosie said. Uh, you can catch me at MC Diabetes on Twitter. Uh, currently, I am the storyteller for a Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition chronicle called London's Bleeding. It is a historical chronicle that takes place just after World War I. This upcoming Wednesday is our finale episode with a special guest. Uh, it is on the Martlet Games channel at 8.30 Central, 9.30 Eastern. You can also catch up with London's Bleeding on our uh, YouTube account as well. I am also a player in a Vampire Vampire campaign on the Saturday Vampire Takeover on Vancouver by Night, Delve into Darkness, uh, along with all the other uh, great games, vampire games that go on on Saturday. Everybody's got good stuff going on on Saturdays, though, I gotta say. Gehenna, Carrion, it's just all over Twitch. We're taking over. It's fantastic. Um, but yeah, check those things out. And I, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me, Rosie. You absolutely nailed it. Thank you. So I once again want to thank my lovely sisters for joining me. And I am Rosie. You can find me on Twitter at mom underscore size. Uh, on Discord and Twitter, I am regular size mom. Uh, send me pictures of cats. I will send you pictures of my cats because cats are awesome. And um, you can find me over on Vorpal Tales every Thursday playing Alien. Uh, last session, my scientist did some pretty crazy things. You know, awesome. Uh, you can find me every Friday over on Gehenna Gaming, being Captain Keats in Vampire Dark Ages. I wear a beard, I talk kind of gruff, and I have a pipe. And then every other Saturday, you can find me here on Karen Comfort Studios playing... Zestra, a blood witch, on Heart City Beneath. When I'm in my true form, my knees are backwards. And I'm really creepy and scary, but I'm also really strong. So this has been awesome. And I'm looking at our producer to see if there's anything else I need to mention. He's just kind of gesturing at me. So I think we're good. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. And for those of you that stuck with us, uh, thank all of you for joining this lovely cast and being so. Tonight, I was joined by Alex, Kitty. Oh, our audio just cut out. Oh, we're good. Yep, <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Wes. Ooh. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I want to hop in real quick. This is the voice of God real quick. Hi, it's Wes, because um, everybody's yelling in the chat. Wednesday at uh, 8.45 p.m. Eastern, we do have a Delta Green game called Burner run by... Uh, Ben Big Dad Walker um, with a cast that uh, it'll be announced soon once I get some uh, confirmed headshots from him and everything like that. Uh, I just want to say thank you each to Alex, uh, 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 Sarah, Natalie, and Kitty, uh, as well as Rosie for running this game. And thank you everybody that has donated so far. Uh, it's fantastic.
Uh, and that's all I got to say. So, Final toast to our bride and lovely viewers. Toast. Cheers, mates. Cheers. Have a good night. Hold your sisters close. Bye.